get here when we get here, right? So here we are. Thirty minutes, you know, you might have yeah, that uh, that sort of thing drives Hold me nuts, on. so I'm sorry. Alright. Say hey! Hi. <laughs> So yeah, I, uh, I work for Copert, I kill bucks for a living. Um, this is kind of a new sport uh, that we're getting into, finally. Um, we've been involved with it, uh, with this particular crop, sort of from the outskirts for a long time, and, and we're finally cleared in hot um, by all of our corporate people, and we're allowed to go work with this crop a lot more than we have in the past, and it's, uh, 
Uh, I don't remember exactly when we were uh, when we were cleared in, but what's for right now in the U.S. Let's say it's been about seven months, and then uh, in Canada it's been a lot longer than that. They have a little bit of a different legal environment up there, so uh, our Canadian subsidiary has been been working in Canada a good bit longer. Um, so either way, I uh, figured I'd give you guys a background a little bit about the company and who we are, because uh, I don't know, have you guys ever even heard of this before? Nope. No. Just from the presentation. So I had never heard of this either uh, until I, I was approached by a, by a headhunter, basically, to, to come work for us. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're fixing that in a hurry. Um, either way, we're the, we're the market leader in biological crop protection and natural pollination. So we're... Uh, Started back in 1967 was when we were officially founded, but we actually began a little bit before that. Um, Jan Covert, Jan Covert, depending uh, how Dutch you want to get, um, he he really. Can I sit there? I got to do the camera. I'm oh, sorry. He wanted to find some stuff for uh, for spider mites. He was he was growing cukes and he was having issues with the pesticides. So he uh, found out about this mite that people were were messing around with uh, a little bit called Persimilis. You guys might have heard of it, and uh, it's, the, it's the most common predatory mite. It's the most common biological pest control sold in the, uh, in the world now. Um, but that was where we started in 1967. Uh, now we're up to about 1,100 employees worldwide. We're operating with 26 subsidiaries in about 90 different countries. Uh, so we're the by far the largest company that does biological pest control. Um, and last I heard, we're larger than almost everybody else put together. But I don't know if that's actually I don't know if that's true. But uh, we're a pretty big company. We're still family owned, though. There's, uh, you know, there's just three guys that, that uh, technically run the show. Um, so to dive right into it, and stop me at any point if you guys have questions. Uh, I was falling asleep. I got some really good coffee on the way here, so I'm not falling asleep anymore. I'm probably going to talk pretty fast. Uh, so if at any point you're like, whoa, hit the brakes, slow down, I'm fine with that. Um, so what's really cool with, uh, at, least, at least with us, is we get to see lots of different things in lots of different areas. Now realize you guys are all basically right here, right? So a lot of your problems are probably gonna be relatively similar. Um, whereas we're, we're gonna have a good bit of experience here. We're also gonna have a good bit of experience in Florida, soon to be Pennsylvania. Um, I already work, uh, I work directly in Connecticut with a, with a facility there. Um, we have a good bit of experience all over Canada at this point, uh, both both indoor and out. Um, so there's, whenever you're getting recommendations, advice, products from us, it's coming sort of from this whole collective thing where we're all talking back and forth and looking at what works in, uh, in a lot of different areas and a lot of different facilities for the same sort of problems. Um, so spider mite, everybody agree that's kind of a recurring theme, biggest issue, more or less? Uh, fungus gnats and shore flies, seem to find those all the time, don't really seem to see where, uh, other than prop and maybe early on in the crop, that they're a big problem. Um, but, I mean, they like what's what. You seem skeptical. I've never heard of the term shore fly. What, what else is it called? Is it also called the fungus gnat, or is that a different animal altogether? Different animal altogether. Okay. So, shore flies are, are technically not plant pests, they're just annoying and gross. Um, so you see them feeding on algae. So if you do any rock wall or just any a lot of anything that's overwatered, technically, uh -huh. um, where there's standing water, you'll have shore flies. So they're very sedentary. They look like little black house flies. They're about the same size, uh, and and when they're bad enough, they'll leave frass deposits on the lower foliage of the plant. So in the ornamental industry, they're bad because nobody wants to buy protein with a with a potted plant. Um, so that's really the problem. Is they're not hurting the plant, they just look gross, and they'll spot up some of the foliage with some poop if they're, if they're bad enough. So, yeah, they're, they're kind of hand in hand. Fungus gnats eat roots, though. Fungus gnats damage plants. What? Sure fly, they're just obnoxious. What did you say about that? Fungus gnats eat roots. So in propagation, when the plant yeah. is trying to produce them and there's not a lot of them, oh. fungus gnats are an issue. If you've got a big healthy root ball and you've got a bunch of fungus gnats, it's not to say it's good. Something's still wrong there, but they're they're gonna have a harder time with the plant with an established root zone. Um, but yeah, I've definitely in, in certain crops, not this one, but uh, specifically in like uh, broadleaf evergreens, I've seen them eat the roots as fast as the cutting can produce them. Now that was me screwing up with the water, but it happens. 
How about thrips? This is a problem for us on the East Coast. Actually, a pretty obnoxious big problem. My garden got hit with thrips recently. Okay. Heavy. Yeah, I come from the East Coast. I know exactly what thrips are. And I worked in the nursery industry, so yeah. Where are you at? Uh, I was in, I worked there in Louisiana. Okay. Yeah, you got plenty of thrips down there. It's uh, around. Thrips, spider mite, we got every bug you got in yeah. the place of the planet down there, and then some. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from South Carolina, and it's uh, anywhere in the southeast, that's where western flower thrips just live. They're there year-round. Uh, now I live in New England, and they have to blow up there every uh, late spring, early summer on the wind. Uh, basically, they well, actually, they probably overwintered this past winter. But generally speaking, they, uh, you know, they, they don't overwinter outside. But I had rosemary overwinter outside this winter, so I guess anything's possible. Um, aphids. <laughs> Finding that to be a pretty pretty uh, recurring theme, especially when things are open and outdoors. Um, you know, if it's if it's indoor, pretty pretty locked down, then we don't see a, a ton of that. But I mean, you guys tell us if it's an issue, and we'll we'll give you advice for it. Uh, and then this is something I hadn't really seen until uh, until I came up here. Were russet mites? Anybody had to deal with russets or broad mites yet? Oh, yeah. Those are our biggest contributing yeah. problem. Yeah. Personally dealt with them. Yeah, no, I always eat the shit out of it. How are they different than the spider man? I've had them. I've had them shipped to my house. Yeah. <laughs> How are they different than a spider mite? They, they look. They're, they're, they're about the size of the leg of a spider mite. They're, they're, like they're about the size of the leg on a spider mite. They're very, very, very small. Yeah. yeah how, how, how much of a, of a uh, uh, microscope or micro, yeah, uh, microscope uh, would you uh, need to see them? Hundred X. Hundred X. Hundred X. Hundred X. Yeah. So so I, 30, saw 30X I, I saw them with a 10x no, yesterday. And they bury up and they bury I saw them with a 10x yesterday. Okay. Just a basic. Oh, yeah. um, but I mean, it's hard. Like he had to tell me. Greg had to tell me what I was looking at. Right. And then once I saw it, I'm like, oh, well, they're, yeah, they're everywhere. It's very easy to identify. Yeah. Like here, you can see the signs, and it basically sure tells you. I mean, yeah. you can yeah. double check with the scope, but it, I mean, once you got it, you you know you got it. Yep. <laughs> For sure. So this is just sort of the brief overview of the pests, right? And I mean, we can go into botrytis, we can go into diseases. Um, we can really talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, I can do this all day. Uh, I think so those are our two biggest concerns, yeah. honestly, right there. Broad mites and russets, like spider mites and anything else we can deal with pretty easily. Yep. Well, it's, those two are our oh, biggest yeah. concerns. Gotcha. I heard they came in with the wine crops, the broad mites and the russet mites. Well, they're not in the valley, it's not popular in the valley, and now they're here. The clone trade propagated those all across the country. Yes. Oh, and they also yeah. say in California yeah. they're, they're, because the farms are so close, they say they're, they're tying that thing to be windblown possibly and from farm to farm. been using yeah. uh, the same thing they use on spider. Are you familiar with the European corn board? <coughs> Have you heard of that one? I've heard of that, but I don't know where or how. But that's yeah, I've done that. I had a big problem with last year that was mm -hmm. causing a lot of betrayals. Oh, that's what used them. Causing betrayals? Yeah, because it like crawls in there. And put my head. Yeah, just. Just makes it It causes an opening so moisture gets in. Yeah, just makes a perfect environment for it. What were they doing there? In flower, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. They were like climbing huh. into the buds and like pooping in there and they're really hard to find. And then it was just like making that. Have you tried, I mean, I'm sure you've tried all like BT. Um, how about uh, any predatory, or not predatory, but beneficial nematodes like carpet capsule? We did nematodes, we did all the sachets, we did a pretty strict IPM program on like yeah, PFR 97, or and just everything like yeah. the, I could think of. That was one thing that we couldn't, we couldn't contain. Hmm. And what we found is if we, uh, they really like light, and yeah. then we made like a, uh, something to attract them to it. Yep. And they would like come in through this light and then they, we could trap them in like that way. And it was my buddy just trying to build something like a design because we were studying like why and how. We've certainly had to do that with certain random things in tomatoes before. Um, and, and I mean, that's a thing too. I, I don't I don't know how often you guys are gonna talk to Greg or anything like that. But Greg's the guy here um, for sure. And he's the guy that you will be speaking with for advice from us. Um, but. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like we know a pretty good bit, but I mean, like I've never even heard of that before. And that's that's sort of why this job's cool, just to be perfectly honest, because you, you get humbled a lot. Um, but we have a huge global network, you know, and, and that's sort of the point with, with working with us is there's so many of us. It's, just, it's not me or him that you're dealing with, or even five people. Um, you know, there's literally uh, 300 people on the other end of my phone. So 
we'll put that out. We'll see what the heck we we'll find Cucumber out. beetles is another big mm -hmm. one. Yeah, that's that's rough. Um, yeah. Indoor, outside door, outdoor. Outdoor. so annoying. Yeah, you run a trap props. I'm sorry, you run a trap prop, something to run away from them, draw their attention away from the main crop. Um, no. So you find something they really like, then they plant that. Yeah, it's not going to completely kill. Well, yeah, they found a the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <one. laughs> beneficial. Something, anything that they like, they're their main food source. Yeah, especially that. if you can find the main food source and put it away from wherever you're actually guarding that. Try to draw them away. I'm going to start taking notes here. Do uh, nematodes uh, take care of uh, uh, fleas? Uh -huh. I heard something about that. Yeah, I, wish I think mulching helps because they lay their eggs. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Uh, so mulching helps keep them from reproducing. It, it depends. So there, there's, I mean, it depends. I'm sure somebody will tell you there's 15 species of nematodes you can find easily, but there's really three. Um, there's Steiner nemofeltiae, that's the main one that you find for uh, fungus nets. There's Steiner Nema carpet capsae, which is the main thing you find for, some people recommend it for shore fly, we don't, but uh, carpet capsae is basically good for killing anything caterpillary, wormy. Uh, and then there's Heteroditis bacteriophora, that one kills, it's really good for grubs. Um, so th those three are really it. And if there's something that has uh, some sort of a wormy part of its life cycle, if you're able to get to it, you can probably kill it with a nematode. But that's all very, very general. <laughs> like it, the devil's in the details. Um, so cute beetles, did I hear that correctly? Cute beetles, yeah. yeah. And then what was uh, what was the first one? European corn borer, right? Yeah. Did you get that like ID from uh, that, yeah. yeah, I think there's cucumber beetles. I always heard them called cabbage beetles. We had a... Uh, Y'all yeah. were talking about the little, they look like little they green, 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 yeah, yeah. So yeah. Kind of yeah. Kind of I thought that yeah. 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 So like door caterpillars. I got, I got, we got yeah. 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 problems with those. Well, I think it starts beach. Well, surf side of Myrtle Beach. Sort of born. Where I was like, I was born in Myrtle. Oh really? Yeah, they tore the hospital down right after I was born. Yeah, Second Avenue. Yeah, not Second Avenue. Second row, Forty Seventh Avenue North. Yeah, South South Beach. We got a condo there, and then we got one on the surf side. Plantation of orchards and shit like that. Yeah. Surfside's, Surfside's cool, man. It is. Yeah. So this is this is something that uh, that we're really big on, and, and we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, you know, I'd like to talk a lot about, just about predators, mites. Sorry. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so before we get into any of this, I, I figured we'd go through just uh, some real brief stuff about application. Um, Basically, the I mean, the biggest thing we found with, with this crop, and basically any crop, if you're going to release mites in it or any sort of a predator, if the plants aren't touching, then the mites or the predators aren't going to leave a plant and go to another one. So the distribution uniformity of your predator apps has to be really spot on, if they're loose anyway. If it's a sachet, then you need a sachet in every plant if they're not touching. Um, you know, and, and these are very important principles to sort of get out of the way first before we... Uh, before we continue on, and you're like, oh, I've tried this mite, it didn't work. Keep this in mind from the very beginning, that uh, if your plants aren't touching, your your uniformity and how you distribute them has to be really, really good. Because if that plant doesn't get any this week, it doesn't get any this week at all. Yep. If you had them all knitted, it would like crawl out of the net, just like a spider mite would. Yeah, trellis. Yeah, trellis netting. If that's where they land, eventually, yeah. But they don't. they won't crawl onto it and leave. Um, so, no. Spider mite love metal and anything. You know, they'll run right up to us in a greenhouse and then parachute all the way down the row. Uh, whereas, you know, predators, they, they're they going to just, if you think about them like a ping pong ball, you know, or even like a pinball, they're just going to go around on green material. Okay. You know, until they run into stuff and eat it. That's really it. It's, cool. Yeah, if it's not green, they live in a one. Uh, and that's the thing, they don't walk past food. So if you've got an area that's got some sort of a problem and you're blowing a predator into it to fix that, they're not gonna leave that area and go somewhere else. Um, so that's really, really important. If, you know, distribution uniformity is critical to making this stuff work. And granted, when I first started using bios, I threw them out like this, call it the, the uh, fairy dust method or the chicken scratch method. And it worked. I mean, I have this job because it worked. Um, so it's not to say that doing it this way doesn't work. It just doesn't work as reliably and it doesn't work as uh, predictably 
uh, and that's really what we're trying to trying to promote is predictability. So if you're evenly distributing these things throughout your crop, you're going to be able to very predictably control existing populations. They're going to just be able to move around a lot more uniformly. Um, who's used cucumeris before? Or cucumeris? Or so it's used in cooler environments. Uh, basically, average daily temperatures in the 50s and the 60s. And I'm going to throw around average daily temperature or ADT a pretty good bit. That's literally a 24-hour average. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, I don't, I don't care what that average is unless they're crazy extremes, unless it's like, you know, 50 degrees at night and 100 degrees during the day. That's technically 75 ADT, but that's pretty, pretty insane. Um, but I mean, still, that's, when we talk about ADTs, that's what we're talking about. Not necessarily, oh, that gets down to, as long as it's the average. Um, it is a low-level generalist predator. So as far as generalists go, it, it, it'll eat anything it finds. It's just only going to do a few of those things really, really well. So climate-wise, it works well in winter and spring. Uh, it, you know, anything over 85 degrees Fahrenheit, it just kind of starts to slow down, doesn't move as fast, doesn't eat as much. So you know, when it's cooler, when you've got those 50s and 60 degree temps, it's, it, it works pretty well. You got sachets, you got loose stuff. Um, and more importantly, this, this also is uh, something where, you know, I was throwing this out doing the chicken scratch thing and I was only doing uh, lower rates and it still worked, still worked. But then I've done it bad on other times and it didn't work. Um, so what we've really found is critical for just reliable long-term success with this mite is you put it in with the snow shovel every week. Uh, it's cheap, it's inexpensive, you can, you can afford it. Uh, and it's... Uh, Pretty critical to use big, big numbers of this one if this is part of your program. And this is kind of a critical part here. Uh, you can't, it's not going to reproduce. So put as many of them in as you want. If you see it making a ton of babies, then please, for the love of God, call us. We want to, I'm going to find out what the heck happened. But um, it probably isn't going to do that. Yeah. So on the, 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 the predatory mite, the, uh, um, when you said the one that everybody gets, um, for spider mites. Oh, uh, persimilis. Yeah, persimilis. Yeah. How do you get that to, uh, to reproduce? Is it just a matter of having mulch on the ground? I notice people that tend to mulch their plants have a better reproduction rate on those. Um, they should be reproducing in the plant. They probably won't lay eggs and mulch. Um, there's other mites that will, like hypoaspis. Okay. And in that case, hypoaspis will be fine. Right. But uh, the biggest thing that we found is that uh, cannabis specifically does, and granted, how many varieties are grown in this room? Like, I've got got four or five? Myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, so this is, it's, it's yeah. a pretty broad, generic statement here. But cannabis typically doesn't have a lot of little hairs on the bottom of the foliage. That's where the predators like to oviposit. There isn't a good spot for them to lay eggs, and any predatory mite doesn't want to really reproduce that well in the crop. It's not to say they won't, but it is definitely saying they're not going to do it that well. How um, do they reproduce well on them? Um, a bunch of other plants, <laughs> unfortunately. So in, in cannabis specifically, reproduction is not anything that we're uh, that we're making on at this point. It's just not a thing. Which, to be honest, you know, once you once you know that, it gets a little easier. I think. But yeah, you're probably not going to see significant reproduction from really anything. Right, cool. um, you might. Who knows? I don't know what kind of varieties you got. You so know? How often do you have to reintroduce those in? Uh, these guys, you have to introduce them weekly because that's about how long they live for, and they don't reproduce in any crop anyway that well. Uh, they reproduce fine in the sachets. They'll eat these little storage mites on, that eat the mold that grows on the brand. Hmm. Um, they'll reproduce on that fairly well. They'll reproduce on pollen fairly well. Um, but not in this crop, for instance. So, uh, you know, with these guys, with cucumeris, it's it's once a week. Um, so specifically, what do these guys eat? They eat the first stage larva of western flower thrips. That's it. The smallest ones. So right after they hatch out of the egg, this mite's able to eat it. Um, smaller mite pests, these work really, really well on that entire broad mite. I wouldn't say nothing really, really loves eating russet mite, but uh, and, and honestly, nothing really loves eating broad mite either. Um, for whatever reason, these things are small and annoying and they don't taste good or something, I guess. Um, they so, do taste terrible. It's awful. It's very bitter. 
to make your fur smell fun. So they uh, are also capable of eating some some spider mite, and this is the thing: we're never going to say, "Hey, yeah, you've got spider mite; you should totally buy cucumeras." Um, but you know, when you've got this sachet that's going to release four thousand mites in a ten inch hanging basket, turns out four thousand mites in a ten inch hanging basket that only sort of eat spider mite adds up to a lot of spider mite control. So it really is an issue of crazy, crazy intro rates. This one actually does a little bit. Don't bank on it. Um, but it happens. So ideally, and this is kind of the big take home that, uh, this is the big take home. Don't mix a bunch of generalist predators together in the same environment because they tend to just eat each other. Um, not necessarily head to head, two big adults going after each other, but these things tend to just find things smaller than them and stick their mouth parts inside of them and suck them dry. And they don't care if it's their buddy. <laughs> if it's smaller than them, they're gonna kill it and eat it. Uh, so in a lot of cases, sorry, I hit the back button. In a lot of cases, people will mix Cucumeris and Swarovski, and there's substantial evidence that that is doing yourself a huge disservice. Um, pick one and go with it, but don't go back and forth. Don't put them in the same environment. Yes, ma'am. Do you have like an Andersoni? Is that one that you guys? No, ma'am. We looked at Andersoni, but Californicus is better in almost every way, so we uh, we chose not to produce that way. And mixing the Swarovski, which one is better for the broad mites? And so this is the catch, that's, that's this guy, because it's the cheapest. So none of them like it, none of them work well. You need a ton of them to fix these smaller mites, these area five mites. Cucumeris is the best then? Cucumeris is gonna probably be your best. Now granted, if it's 95 degrees every day and it's hot and dry, these guys are gonna suck one too. Um, there's really not a great option. Um, but if you know the, the temperatures are right, the, the environment's right, you don't already have a crazy Swirsky population that you're gonna interfere with, or you know, just all things being equal, hey, I suddenly have a ton of broad mite, or a bunch of russet mite, that's the one that you're gonna wanna blow in every week. Hmm. How long do the Swirskis last? Do they only last a week too, or? Swirsky lasts a little bit longer, um, but but not by, the, the problem is, bless you, where did I came from? Um, Swarovski reproduce like crazy, but just not in this crop. <laughs> so this this one doesn't. The, we'll get the we'll get the Swarovski in in a second here. But the, the great thing about this one is when you are talking about going after area five mites, the really small ones, you need yeah. three, four, five hundred, six hundred per meter every week for rates. You need crazy, crazy numbers. Maybe throw some sachets in there too, just to really be a jerk, you know. And, and for cucumeras specifically? Yes. What were those? No, for any of them, for area five mites. So, I mean, if you're talking about cucumeras at 20 bucks a bottle and Swarovski at 100, <laughs> buy the cucumeras. <laughs> 300 to 500 for square meter, was it? I mean, minimum. Depends on the, depends on the, the severity, but I mean, cucumeras, period, we don't really recommend going below 300 per meter a week anyway. Um, below that, results start getting a little spotty. So the sachets just sit on the soil for the throwbacks? Um, it depends on the crop, but generally speaking, um, especially in this crop, and I mean, you guys more or less know what your relative humidities are, right? Like, you guys running 50 or below, like where are you guys at? 50 to 60. 50 so that's, I mean, that's not bad, um, but generally speaking, sachets function because there's a mold growing on bran. So as soon as they dry out, the mold dies, and the entire system collapses. Uh, cannabis, we find that is the single biggest issue with sachets. These things are supposed to go four to five weeks. Hardly ever do they go four to five weeks. Because it's not humid enough. Correct. Okay. So you've got two different options. Either you put it on the soil so that it's wicking moisture up through the bag onto the outer surface of the bag. The bags are all lined. Every supplier in the world, I think, has some sort of like a, a saran wrap inside of that paper. So you can um, get it wet. So you can get the outside of it wet a little bit to wick moisture up, and that, that sort of helps the microclimate. Um, the other option is you bury that thing in the head of the plant so that it doesn't see daylight, and it's got more of the plant's microclimate giving it a little shelter. But basically, if, if you know, and you can tear these things open every single week and see what's going on. Um, you know, we've got a lot, of, a lot of places where we're just replacing every two weeks, because that's how long they last. And you can't do loose applications over the top, so at least later in the crop. So that's it varies from every single facility. And all the bugs actually make it out of the sacket; they don't stay in the satchel. They just die. 
I mean, I, no, most of they should leave. I've been ripping them open and spreading them around just because I, I think that they might like. A lot of times they left that packet. They ain't going nowhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I don't know personally. I wouldn't tear them open if they're still actively producing mites because then the system crashes. So as soon as that brain gets distributed, the mold dies. The feeder mites die. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to ship you a, a, a Swarovski mite plus sachet with, I don't know, it's got like 100 adults in it. It's going to release 800 adults over four weeks. So if that thing is spread open, you got 100 adults. Oh, okay. And the system crashes. And you've just got a, a loose bottle at that point. So, yeah, it's that breeding system that's in the, in the bag that, assuming it's humid enough and the mold is producing on the brand, that it keeps working. Um, so at the end of four weeks, if you've still got activity, then sure, yeah, you got your money's worth, you can toss it. But, um, yeah, and, and I mean, we didn't, I didn't really get into this on any of the slides, but for sure, if you guys are using sachets, tear, tear a few open once a week and see how that longevity is going. That's how you, I mean, that's really how you test these things. It's, and just the one bowl on either side is enough for them to come out when they yep. want to. Yep, and that's the first quality check. Pick up the bag and look at it. If it's covered in mites, check is complete. Put it back on the planet and go look at another one. If it's if there's nothing going on and that's a two-week-old bag, pour it open or tear it open, pour it on something black. Um, white paper is way over-recommended for scouting. Mites are clear. Like, put them on something black. It's a heck of a lot easier to see what the heck you're dealing with. Um, so this is my favorite one. I was telling the guy yesterday I'm probably getting a tattoo of this one. Um, and I'm not even kidding. But uh, so Swarovski does everything. The problem is, and I mean, I don't know, this isn't normal weather, right? No, no, Swarovski doesn't way. work right now. Um, but yeah, and, and that's sort of the problem. Swarovski needs heat. So it needs ADTs at or above 68. And if it's cloudy, and we're talking outdoor, uh, 68 doesn't even cut it because you don't have the solar radiation. You need sunshine at 68 degrees average daily temperature for these things to work. If it's cloudy, you better be shooting for 71, 72 air time. So in a greenhouse would be good for these guys then? Yes. Or it's, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, or just summer, you know, period. They just, they just, they need heat. So the plant will burn up and die before these things do. They don't have a maximum threshold in this crop. Uh, you can get as hot as you want it to get, they're gonna love it. Uh, another question. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll recommend heat treating rooms, so that's like getting up to like 120 for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Would they survive that? Heck no. <laughs> okay. Well, to the plants? No. Yeah. 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 yeah it's pasteurization. It's what you're doing, you're pasteurizing the roots. Um. For 20 minutes? Yeah. You gotta soak them. Huh? Test it. Maybe. They come from another. I mean, it's a Mediterranean light. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's from the med. They don't. You know, they're, they're wild in Israel, Egypt. Um, it gets pretty warm there. So 20 minutes, I don't know. I think just about anything survives 20 minutes. So we actually had UPS screw up some sachets. as they arrived at 105 degrees uh, a week or two ago. And uh, the entire system wasn't toast. The Swarovski were fine, the feeder mites were all gone. But uh, so yeah, it's possible. I, I think that's sort of the, one of the other takeaways is this, these things are, ridiculously complex systems, you know, and it's really easy for us to get up here and be like, oh yeah, it's like a pesticide, you put this out and it works. Well, yeah, most of the time, you know, but it's, I think there's a lot of like dogma where it's like, this is this and this is that. And the reality is there's a billion moving parts in one of these things that we're talking about. Just this one mite going into a crop trying to find this one target. There's literally a billion moving parts. It's very, very complicated systems and we can sort of predict what's gonna happen just based on experience, but Maybe they can survive 140 for two hours sometimes, who knows. Um, so yeah, it reproduces really well in other crops. That's why we love it so much. That's why uh, you know we're the biggest company in the world that manufactures it. Um, well, we actually patented it, um, you know, the production technique. Um, but what's interesting in cannabis is its wide dietary range. You're not gonna buy this and spend extra money for it because it reproduces. Maybe it does every now and then but you're getting it because of its food sources and how, how much it eats. Um, once again, loose apps, they work really well in prop, they work really well in veg, and then as soon as you guys start, uh, start uh, going towards flowers, maybe it's uh, a sachet time. Um, 
Thrips per nation ranges are about the same as Cucamaras. So we don't oversell it and be like, hey, these guys are way better. They're way better at 90 degrees. Um, at that point, Cucamaras is falling way off, but at 75, 80 degrees, they're about tied for amount of thrips that they'll eat in a given day. Um, just like Cucamaras, they only eat the L1 larva. That's why this picture is such a trip. I keep finding it on our website. And that's, uh, that's two big mama Swarskis that are looking at an L2 thrips going, heck no. Um, and that's really sort of the basis of what this whole thing's about. That's bigger than they are, they, they're not gonna eat it. Simple as that. Not, not a predatory mind anyway. There's other things that can, but not these guys. So, first stage larva, white fly eggs. White fly factor in this crop? I've heard it's like a random weird thing every now and then. But yeah, what is? I've seen it before. I didn't see it last year. I've seen it here before. It happens. I've seen it in the line. Okay. These are these are good. Um, they're they're not a one stop shop because white fly are really complicated and they only eat the eggs, but they help. Um, and they're just as good at eating any other russet mite or broad mite as as cucumeris. They just cost way more. So you know, keep that in the back of your head. This is what's interesting though, they do eat spider mite and we will put that on the label. Um, whereas cucumeris, you need a pretty insane quantity. You need five sachets in a single pot that are fully cranking out that have any effect on spider mite at all. Whereas these guys, if they happen to walk past a spider mite and it's smaller than they are, it's dead. Um, they, they, don't, they don't walk past them. Um, I keep hitting that back button, I'm sorry. So ideally, this should not be mixed with with cucumeris. Um, cucumeris, a big cucumeris will eat a very small Swirsky. And a big Swirsky will eat just about every size of cucumeris if it gets the opportunity. And we found some crops will, where they will stop predating thrips, they will stop predating whitefly and just go after each other. I can't tell you if that's this crop or not, because we don't have that kind of data yet, but we've seen significant intra-guild predation with uh, the Swarovski and Cucumeris using the same system. So this is kind of the catch. Um, we don't even have it in this packaging yet, but uh, this is something that is released officially right at the end of the month. Um, and we're, I don't know, based on what we've seen, we're, we're all extremely excited about this. So that man is holding a sachet the size of a ketchup package. And it actually feels like a ketchup package. It's made out of industrial uh, compostable, like one of these cornstarch plastic yeah. mylar almost. Uh, so it's totally getting away from that whole paper sachet thing. So everything we talked about before with the, hey, these things only last two weeks, now you can kind of forget about that. Um, so completely new material design, the whole nine yards that uh, we've, we've really developed to, to see if we can put sachets in really wet locations. Turns out we can also put them in really dry locations and still see almost full rate of lifespan. Um, so specifically in cannabis, we're seeing way more mites released over a way longer period of time. And uh, you know, in, in situations where we've done some uh, some initial testing, I've seen a standard Swarovski Plus sachet toasted inside of seven days. Like I showed back up seven days later, and they were already completely gone. Um, where you know we've gone into that exact same uh, mother scenario, and still seeing releases at three and a half weeks. Now they're tapering off at that point. This place was running about thirty-eight or forty percent in, in stock, so it was pretty dry. But uh, still, in an area where we killed a, a sachet in less than a week, these were going for longer than three. And we've, we're seeing that replicate itself, not just one little grow room, but this is now actually uh, in, in all of our trials all over the US and Canada right now, it's, it's showing the same results. So this is a huge one. So it's not to say, this is where it gets a little more complicated, where yeah, cucumeris is great if you gotta kill russet mite and broad mites, it's cheap. But this is really easy in that you just put them in and they go for three or four weeks. Um, man, I keep back accidentally hitting that back button. Um, so yeah, this is this is a huge product for us. It's coming out. We'll have this uh, out of trial phase within about three or four weeks. Um, as it is, we're doing you know trials all over the place and it's <coughs> killing it. Literally. Literally. <laughs> So this is the OG predatory mite. This is Phytosilus persimilis, Perseus, 
our product line is called Spidex. Um, this is the, the biggest predator sold in the world, and it's uh, our single biggest product in the U.S. because of field strawberries. So, strawberries? Yeah. These all come out of Oxnard, California. Um, got a nice big fancy uh, filling, potting, bottling thing there that we're, uh, Greg, can we ship those up here like four days a week? Is that basically how it works? Yep. You guys are spoiled. I get them twice a week in, on the East Coast. Um, so this is where it gets really interesting because I, I realized telling you guys that mixing generalist predators might be against what you've heard previously. And also it means what the heck do I do for spider mites? Um, and that's where this guy comes in. So old school theory with this one is that, hey, they really need high spider mite density to work. Uh, they need a lot of humidity to reproduce. Well, they're not reproducing anyway, so not really. So don't worry about that. But what's cool is, um, and it's why they cost so darn much to produce, there's only one thing that they eat. We can't rear them on an artificial food source. They only eat spider mite. So it costs a pretty good bet to produce this per mite. The bottles don't seem that much because you're only buying 2000 or something. So, oh, yeah, that's a $10, $15 bottle. Well, per mite, they're actually pretty expensive because their food source is spider mite. And we can't ship you the food source. Whereas with every other mite, you're buying what we grow it on. Somehow, I'm not even allowed to know. They scoop it up, stick it in a bottle. Whole thing. Whereas with this, it's got to be separated. Um, so we're not shipping you spider mite. But what's interesting about that, just as an example, is uh, it can't go in and eat, eat your Swirsky. It will not go in and eat your Cucumeris, it will not eat your Californicus or Andersoni if you still want to use that. Uh, it's only going to affect Spider-Man. That keeps it simple. There's a lot of moving parts. If you can take one or two out, then, then that helps. So they're extremely mobile. Um, once again, that only helps if the plants are touching. If they're not, you've got to make sure every plant gets a dose. Um, reproduction is based on humidity. If it's dry, they're not reproducing, but in your crop, they're not reproducing anymore. Anyway. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're a little more aggressive than the, uh, the standard generalist predators that we've been talking about. So maybe they might lay an egg or two, but if you see a population explosion, once again, please call us. We want to take that thing and breed it. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so basically what we've really transitioned to in ornamentals are just, you know, oh, well, we've got to have some sort of a population to sustain them. Now, generally speaking, and this is kind of the shocking part, everybody's really happy if every biological agent that you, you buy dies of starvation. Um, our focus is not to have a happy ecosystem, specifically in ornamental plants. If there's a happy ecosystem and there's reproduction, <laughs> significant reproduction of biologicals, then you've got a lot of food. And if you've got a lot of food, you've got a lot of damage. You're losing, you're losing harvest weight, you're losing time, you're losing something. Um, so where that threshold with you guys is, that's your own threshold. We're, we don't tell you what that is. You guys have to determine what you're happy seeing for damage. Um, and then we're you know, able to give you tools and, and rates and introduction guides to, to help you stay there or below it. In ornamentals, when you start dealing with a guy that's growing petunias, or poinsettias or any, you know, anything you buy in a garden center, it's zero. You can't sell a plant covered in dead bugs. You can't sell a plant covered in any bugs. Zero. So you're shoveling these things in there once a week because the idea is uh, if you put a thousand on this table and an aphid lands right here, a spider mite or whatever, you want something right there ready to eat it and kill it and make it go away. The rest of these guys are screwed. <laughs> and that's uh, sort of the concept. You want a nice, even coverage over this entire area of good guys so that when that one thing happens to try to start, there's something right there ready to take it. Otherwise, if you've put in lower rates or you've used lower distribution uniformity, now this blows up into this before the two guys over here find it. And now you're four weeks trying to get control of this while the population finds it and tries to build on it, which it has a tough time building on it because it doesn't have a good spot to lay eggs. Keep that in mind. Um, but this is one of those things where you're going to put them in. Most of them are hopefully die of starvation, but they're very mobile. They run around a lot, and they will eat anything that gets in front of them that's a, that's a two-spotted spider mite, any size, egg to adult. They've got a preference, but it's a, it's a very interesting product to be able to put in there in combination with Cucumeris or in combination with Swarovski and just say, all right, <laughs> 
2,000 of you guys, go hunt. You know, four of you guys are probably going to be the the ones that I actually pay for this week. So will this be the only one that you can use in conjunction with others? You I don't want to make it sound that black and white, but it's certainly the most predictable one to use wow. with a generalist because it can affect them. And if it's not laying eggs, they can affect it. Just keeps it very simple. One generalist, one very specialist. So this is where we break that rule. This is Californicus. Um, so this will be an augmentation. Now, if we were giving this talk in Colorado, this is just part of a plan. I, I met a guy from Colorado that was 60 years old that had never seen an air conditioner drip on the ground in the summertime out of his car. So we're on a plane, we're flying to, um, he was coming back from Providence from settling his aunt's estate. And uh, he had taken her car to the dealership to sell it. And he thought it was broken because the water was dripping off the condenser and he'd wow. never seen that before. <laughs> he was like 60 and he'd never seen a car drip water off an air conditioning condenser. Um, that's how dry it is in Colorado. So that's where this would really come in. Whereas here, I mean, you guys tell me, how bad are spider mites? Is it just crazy or is it? It gets out of control. Like, yeah. yeah. You go yeah. get like a clone or plant from something, 95% of the time, it's probably got some damage on it. Which right. is very unfortunate. So a lot of people start just doing their own. Right. You know, pop your seeds. You get yeah. Well, and that, that's sort of the catch, right? So, um, I, I think I have that down here. <laughs> there you go. It's really only recommended. We're introducing a complicating factor now. Now we've got two generalists running around in a crop. We've got Swarovski or Cucumeras, and we've got this. Um, now granted, we got a lot of protocols where Californicus and Swarovski are running around side by side, and that's fine. Maybe they turn on each other at some point. But the, the pest uh, relationship with the crop is one thing. But the, the predator relationship with the crop is something too. So we know in roses that the interaction between Californicus and Swarovski is pretty minimal. Just for whatever reason, they don't seem to really go after each other that much. Um, other crops we found, it's not, not that case. They, uh, they find each other first. So we don't recommend it right out of the gate and say, hey, you should, you should blow both of these guys in here every week from prop all the way to flower. Um, but if you're in a situation where you're always buying in cuttings and you're concerned that you're buying them in or it's like, man, we have spider mite all the time. If, you have, if you're saying that, yeah, that's the case, then, then this needs to be built in there. It's an added layer of complication, but they're really not going to cause a problem with, any of the, with the other generalist until there's no more spider mite anyway. So if you're really happy and your crop's spotless and they start eating each other, then it could be worse, right? Um, sold loose, sold in sachets, either way, there, uh, there's, there's options there. Uh, and once again, this, this one has a much wider temperature range than, uh, than Andersoni. Um, definitely heard Andersoni getting a pretty good bit of press. And it's, a, it's an interesting mite. It was really developed to, to feed on thrips, to be a competitor to Swarovski. Um, you know, and then it got sort of re remarketed or rebranded, I guess, sort of as an as a all-purpose spider mite predator. But um, it's been doing a good job on the rod mites and stuff. So they've been not doing the micro mites. It's a, it's, it's a good generalist predator for sure. Um, whereas with, uh, with this one, you're going to have a bit, bit more temperature range, a little bit more resilience. In other crops, you'll have way more egg laying. Um, not in this one. But yeah, the, the real catch with the, with the broad mite is numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. So none of these guys are going to go after broad mite or russet mite any significantly better than another one. That's the take on it. Whatever one you're already using, I mean, unless you want to spray soap or self oil and wipe the whole system out and start over with cucumeras. Whatever one you're using, it's probably cheaper to just quadruple the rate for three weeks and go nuts and wipe them out. Because no, none of them want to eat those little things. I don't know. Just, I guess they taste like crap. So this is a cool one too. Who, who deals with aphids? I mean, I have. Oh, well, I don't know. pretty much. I don't, I don't know. Root aphids are kind of the, the, the bad guys right now. So we can talk about that one next. Just real quick, this is uh, not a predatory mite. You kind of treat it like one. You blow it in, high distribution uniformity, yada, yada, yada. But it uh, stays where you put it, and it's just little alligators that crawl around the plant, and they literally tear everything into it. Um, 
They're, uh, and if you actually find them working, good luck, they're nocturnal, but if you find them working, it's, uh, it's horrifying. It's really cool. <laughs> and is that its adult stage, the picture to the left? Negative. The adult stage is this little green, like, fairy-looking fly. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a, a yeah, it looks like this little magical thing you'll find flying around in the evening or something. Like, they're really cool. Huh. Um, but no, it's a green lace wing. It's a very, very cool little fly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is a very different appearance from larva to its whole. <laughs> very. Um, but the biggest results are from the final larval development phase, and this is important because some people will just run them for like a week and then spray and peed or something like that. And really that range of maximum result is sometime between day five and day eight or something. Depends on environment. But that final phase of larva before they pupate is when they're just going out and mowing down aphids. They'll eat about 300 per. Is that five to eight days from egg? Or from hatch. So when you buy our larval product, um, they're L1 larva basically. So depends on environment, um, but you know, 78 degrees, you're probably looking at a maximum effect right at about six days after introduction. Did it Google out? I know this is a silly question, but I was wondering like. I've never seen, I've barely found them, okay. much less poop. So. I'm, well, I'm always been curious about that. I never knew. Uh, uh, I mean, how many? <laughs> it, what's weird, and I, I've seen him do this. It was really sick. Um, we we kind of felt bad about it afterwards, but we had a bunch of the petri dish sealed up at a trade show, and a USB um, little microscope on them, and you know, running on my laptop at, at this big trade show in uh, Columbus every year. And me and uh, a new guy that we just hired were standing there, and. Like, what the heck are they, are they you know are they getting it on like look in there and it's like no they're not so they're they're jerks they're cannibalistic as heck um and uh we look down there and you literally just watch the mass from one of them over about two minutes transfer to the other one so there's two that are this big and now there's one that's this big like holy crap you know, let's give it another one and uh you know and, and literally you can just watch them they don't they don't seem to let much go <laughs> They just take it in and take it in and do that hungry, hungry caterpillar thing, uh, you know, until they're at a certain size, certain age, and then they uh, they pupate and they turn into cool little green fairy looking flies. Um, a fiddleides, if you guys are really really concerned about uh, you know foliar aphids, not root aphids, a fiddleides really rounds it out really really well. Um, but it doesn't seem like that's a big topic for you guys, so aphids aren't any fun anyway. Um, I'll keep it moving. Um, and then parasitoids as well. That's when you'd use one of the wasps that, that lays an egg in one of these things. If you're like, hey, we have a recurring problem with this species. Once you, once you know which one it is you're trying to go after, then uh, the wasps can help as well. Cup of coffee. Um, yeah. yeah, we're Dutch. We're really, in, I'm not, but the company is we're really into coffee. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, at this point, it's up to you guys. Q&A, yeah. whatever you want to talk about. What's the, and I mean, we don't have anything great for that. There is no creepy crawly, except for maybe a little bit of roast beetle I've heard. But they only- we don't even sell it. But see, the only thing is they only eat stuff that's on the surface. They won't dig yeah. into the ground. Yeah, root aphids, you pretty much, you gotta shut down for 30 days. Now I've heard that uh, a That's Met 52 really works. Way. It's completely shut out for 30 days, I think. I've heard Met 52 works really well on the soil, and, I, and I'm, I'm almost certain I've, I've seen Botanic Guard work really well on the soil. Yeah, now um, the Botanic Guard and the Suffolk X mix, I know it works really well for the uh, the russets. But I have a buddy in Cali that got them two years ago and didn't know what the hell that's what he ended up using sprayed up two weeks before August and went and tested and all tested fine. Hmm. You know, because it's just a, a score. Well, Tanigar is not going to do much against Russet. I mean, maybe BioWorks is going to call me when I'm leaving here and tell me I'm a liar, but well, it's no. Yeah. Well, it's the Suffolk. So no, the Suffolk, yeah, I mean, it's sure. a combo, but I mean, but still the combo, it, it worked. It was the Suffolk. It was Suffolk. Suffocate them. Yeah, exactly. So, the, I mean, the biggest thing we look at, we have to deal with the tomatoes a pretty good bit. And when you see Russet mite, it's, it, they're usually exposed on the fruit. So you can get in there with a, with a soap and just absolutely nuke them. So you get in there with, uh, you know, basically uh, impede. Well, you ruin their day. I use Castile soap and pesperidone oil on it. 
same thing. Yeah. Well, not same thing, but but still same, same motivation. Fact, you know, it has citric acid. It has a lot of you know yep. essential oils. And, so yeah, with uh, with root aphids though specifically, um, any of these fungal insecticides, they need high humidity to be at their best effect. Try your pots out as much as you can. Basically, yeah. if you use a lot of rock wool or something like that, it's more common. Yeah, and that's one of the ounce of prevention where the whole freaking trunk load of pure on that shit. Just watch everything comes in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys have messed with Met 52 or not, but Metaresium is a really good soil based insecticide fungus. Um, so, you know, it's not, not a product we sell, but, you know, if that's a recurring issue for you guys and you haven't tried metaresium, get some metaresium and try that stuff. Um, that just came back on the market. Yeah, 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 just, yeah that, that's a new, a new reintroduction. We should have one at some point, but a couple years probably. Um, but regardless, that would be, if you haven't tried metaresium and it is a recurring issue, try some. Yes, ma'am. What did the neem tones really help with then? Um, <laughs> specifically, fungus things that are more larval in the soil. So, fungus gnats. It would kill the shit out of fungus gnats. That's what I use. Yep. And you can just use a pea instead of because that there's a whole bunch in that thing. You gotta use it all in one setting. I can't speak for other people's products, but it's almost never homogenous. So the blend could have all 50 million or whatever you're buying. It could have most of those in one end. So if you guys split it in half, especially with ours, um, you know, with ours we sell a package that does uh, basically a thousand one-gallon pots, thousand square feet. Um, so that's the smallest one we make, and yeah, that's mix it up in a backpack, spray it on, run the whole thing. Well, what do y'all sell? Lane is our expert guy. Uh, we have Feltier in the shop, which is for, for nematodes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the big generalists. I think it does go after fleas a little bit. I've seen it a couple times, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, those are probably not a homogenous mixture. It's the thing, you know, it's one big box. How do you know yeah. if you only got a gallon to mix it up in uh, at a time? I mean, I mean uh, I, I, once again, I don't know what, what other people are recommending, but uh, nematodes usage is, is sort of a university level thing that was figured out a long time ago. So I've definitely seen weird little startup companies uh, say that they have these crazy awesome nematodes that are, you can only use like a tenth of them and they'll reproduce for two months or something. And I don't, maybe that's true, but there's, the majority of the global nematode market is pretty simple. 500,000 per square meter. So like you just spray the rest of them out in your yard or something, your lawn or something. Like I mean, the rest of them. Or, you, or you over apply them. I mean, it, it's really up to you. But if you're buying a 50 million pack, which is probably the size that you guys are stocking, that's about this thing. That's. Yeah. I mean, it, that could be 50 or 10, 50. 10, 10 million. Isn't that what y'all do? Uh, I forget the. I think, I think it's 10 million, million or something like that. Like that. Yeah. So yeah, a 50 million pack is good for a thousand square feet, and a 250 million pack is good for 5,000 square feet. Um, so so we bought an acre. I think she said it on the. Hey, how many did you say for 5,000 square feet? 250 million. 250 million. Yeah, that sounds weird to me. An acre of nematodes is a truckload of nematodes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, an acre of nematodes would be uh, would be four boxes of 500 million, um, so two billion nematodes would be the recommended rate. Now people take that rate and throw it right out the window all the time. I mean, just because we say this is what you should do, do whatever the heck you want, <laughs> it's your money. Um, but for consistent results week after week, we mess with the application frequency, we don't really mess with the rate that much. Um, if you apply nematodes properly at the suggested rate and you do everything correctly, they always work. It's pretty cool uh, for a buyer to be able to say that. Um, but when you start messing with the rate, when you start messing with, or when you screw up anything else, then that goes out the window. But um, you know, when the when the steps are followed properly, it always works. Do you guys have any trichogramma for cutworm? Uh, no, we do not do trichogramma. We we outsource that one. That's the one product that that we outsource. <coughs> so we so only use it in like one product. Yeah, as far uh, as the cool. budworms go, that's what Mariah said is the one that is, um, it's, you know, that the moths lay the eggs on the plant and then mm -hmm. as the buds develop, they're hatching out, going into the buds, doing their thing. Um, 
and so I, I think it's a cut mark, but might be well, I mean, a dry the solution there is probably really the, the one that you want to go with, and and for sure, Trekker Grandma would be interesting to play with there, but we have no, I have no background there. Do you um, have anything that would go after? Uh, I'm writing this down. Caterpillars or the, the worms or the moths. Or yeah. well, I think the problem you don't even know the, the, the egg falls over, over and you see like little yeah. water out in pieces. Right, because the worm crawls out through the damn bud, so well, you'd have to get them at the, at the egg stage. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing, and, and I know nothing about this pest, <laughs> so I'll look into it, but I mean, the biggest thing with any pest like this, with any sort of a moth, if, uh, you know, you're going into any tomato house or any, any place where there's, you know, a, a ton of money, they're going to have delta traps hanging up, they're going to have pheromone lures, and they're going to have monitoring plates, and they're going to be scouting for these things weekly. Um, and when they start to see numbers hit some sort of a mark, then something is done to control that. So if this is something that you're dealing with, we need to identify the exact species, and then you need to get pheromone mowers, and you need to get a trap set up so that you can start telling exactly when they show up. And then you can time, I don't know, take your pick. There's a lot of different things you can kill them with. Y'all sell pheromone lures and all that? Heck yeah. All right, cool. Well, we yes, we do. Um, more than I've ever had to deal with. I mean, I've had to deal with three, but I go down that list and it's, you know, it's a ton of stuff. But yeah, I mean that's. Do you sell them for broad bites and thrusts? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, they're uh, they they don't really work that way. They're just they're pretty simple. They don't have wings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Arabico Organics. I'm sure you're familiar with them. I have not heard of them. They say uh, they sell nematodes also, and they they're saying 50 million does one acre. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally off. It's, I mean, and, and I'm not talking about our numbers. I'm talking about every major research university that's ever looked at nematodes. Is there right? different, I mean, that many different <laughs> types of nematodes that that could be? Uh, I mean, it could be something else. I mean, it could be, yeah, we saw this work with Rio Bravo and Citrus in Florida or something. I don't know. I'm um, saying 500 million would do 10 acres. What's the species? Uh, just as nematodes. That's your first indication right there. Right? <laughs> uh, and maybe they're right, you know, but I, that is, um, that's peer-reviewed science. It's kind of done. Um, that we, we have a good idea of how these things work. And don't get me wrong, people cut the rate in half, but I mean, to say that... If I, I guess they do have a bunch of different ones. Okay. So... Uh, no, that, uh, that, that seems off to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two biggest companies that make them um, are, are going to say 500,000 per square meter, which is essentially 50,000 per square foot. I mean, that's the give or take 100,000. But uh, yeah, 50,000 per foot is the, the U.S. rate. Any more questions? Good deal. Let's get some stuff away. You guys got some stuff to give away, right? Greg? Greg? What are we giving away, Greg? Uh, well, we're talking about uh, consultation and $500. Outstanding. Okay, let's give that. Uh, Scott gave me these to get away real quick, so we'll do these. Got a Herculean harvest for somebody. Oh, uh, big money. 3988. What? Let's try to get this one off the wall. 3988? 398. Yeah! 398. And then uh, this one, some Aphrodite's extraction. 3984. 3984. Holy moly! Now the big one. Pick one out of there. Let's give one a. Let's work. Five hundred dollars in a consultation. You ready? You're the picker. <laughs> Mixing them up. I'm not looking. What do we got? Yeah, I don't know. We got three eight four three nine eight six. Woo! There you go. Yeah. George's a big winner this week. Yeah, yeah. Won all kinds yeah, of stuff. Right. Hey, 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, guys, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You don't have to twist my arm to come to work. That's it. Thanks for coming. I swear, Robert Tony is the guy that's yeah. yeah. um, that guy back there. Uh, Greg. Greg is the co-programmer.
So, uh, you know, there's there's 30 of us here in the U.S. But yeah, Greg is Greg's a local guy. I'm just a guy from Texas. Oh, I'm from Colorado. Yeah, that's. I mean, specifically what we're what we're here for is to do direct consults, you know, and, and actually come in and, and visit with you guys as soon as you're. We've got some weird corporate stuff that we need to see you have the license. And yeah, of course, all the proper paperwork. Yeah. That, that way, it's fine. What's going on, Brian? Brian? Brian. 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 Yeah, that's great. And we saw that. Matt you the other day. Oh, yeah, good show. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For sure. Cool. Do you have a car? Yeah. 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 Do you have a car? Yeah. 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 Did I give you one already? I think yeah. they were the same. That's probably very good in my car yeah. stuff, but. Right on. I can give you yeah. that. Yeah. Cool. I'm gonna go over some buds right now. Actually. So, yeah. Thanks. Nobody else got a chance. Great. Yeah. Thank you guys. They have here too. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Right. Card. Yeah. Let me let me go grab some cards. Sure. You especially, right? Yes. 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 Love card. Yeah. I think you need to be able to reach out there. Perfect. Where are you at? Uh, Walterville, McKenzie River. I don't know what it is, but okay. <laughs> it's it's like 35 minutes from here, uh, kind of east. Gotcha. So this place is nuts, man. It's from oh, you're in the middle of it all. It's perfect. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, the yeah. coast, like an hour. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. You got the mountains right here. You got, got Washington, like like three national forests, and like 20 minutes away. There's yeah, zoos nice. all over here too. So it's pretty cool. No, I want it. I'm uh, I'm I don't know. I uh, don't get to come out here enough. The Northeast is okay and everything, but people are a little bit tired. Yeah, it's more relaxed. I mean, you always get those groups of shitheads. It turns out they're everywhere. Exactly. Well, I think there's a few ones that get away from things and they kind of burn things. I bounce out of Arizona because it sucks. There's no license available except for the lottery winners there. Where? Arizona. It's a, it's a, honestly, it's all about me there as far as the cannabis market. Yeah. And on top of that, they That's treat the whole like, East Coast. Is it? Yeah, I knew New York was, was that bad. Did Comcast money? <laughs> you know, cra crazy money back. Arizona's Arizona. University of Phoenix money, and then everybody else who can get in on it. Like, really? One of the larger shops there is that. Uh, their money came from University of Phoenix. In fact, the University of Phoenix vice president. That's a for-profit university. Bro, right? they're, like, yeah, they they're got, killing it. They got satellite campuses all over the country. Yeah, they're killing it. I was going to ask you before I'm waiting on a card from your buddy. Um, what about uh, in Carcia Formosa for fun snacks? Not even. Not even a little bit. Two species of water. Okay. So they'll eat more. They'll eat more. They'll eat more. I have. Yeah, and it's a learning environment, and, but so we try not to try to eradicate everything, but people are choking on this last season. Um, I mean, bottom line, man, all the work we've done, you know, everything else, there's always just a 